Welcome to the sixth video on the solar system. Today we're going to look at the planet Mars. Now Mars has captured our fascination for centuries and it is one of the most visited planets in our solar system. We have sent more robots to Mars than any other planet. And so we've been drilling, scooping up Martian soil, and looking for any signs of life, past or present. We've also sent numerous satellites that orbit Mars, and they have collected data for literally decades. And this has allowed scientists to map the entire Martian surface. And we'll talk about some of those satellites and rovers in a few slides. Now it is thought that Mars might have resembled Earth's environmental conditions eons ago, but today it is essentially a cold desert planet. But it is still one of the most fascinating planets in the solar system, so it is every bit worthy of our discussion. Now Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun, and it is often referred to as the Red Planet. Mars is known for its amazing scenery. It has some of the largest volcanoes and mountains in the entire solar system. And we'll review some of those in a few slides. Now, as I mentioned, Mars used to have water, but it is all gone. Where did it go? Well, a lot of it evaporated into the solar system, and some of it is believed to be frozen below the surface of Mars. And so that raises a tantalizing question. Was there life on Mars at some point? Because if Mars at one point billions of years ago had similar conditions to Earth, there's every reason to believe that life might have arisen in the same manner it did on Earth, even if it was at the microscopic level. But to date, no fossilized evidence has ever been found, but it has been proven that their conditions were ripe for life. And as we know, the only explorers to Mars so far have been robots, and we'll go over those in a few slides. Now, a Martian year equals 687 Earth days, that is a 24-hour day. The average distance from Earth is 225 million miles. But there are times where it is much closer than that and much farther than that. Now, some other tidbits about Mars. Mars has two polar ice caps, very similar to Earth. It is about one-third the gravity of Earth. Mars also has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, and we'll go over those in a few slides. The average temperature on Mars is around minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's a very, very, very cold planet. It's about 4,000 miles in diameter, and that equates to about roughly half the size of the diameter of Earth. And if we take a look at this slide, you can see the difference in size between the two planets. Now, if you stripped away the oceans from Earth, Mars would have about the same amount of land. So both planets are about the same size if you just factor in land. Okay, so the very first spacecraft to land on Mars was the Viking 1, and that landed on July 20th, 1976. Its objectives were to analyze soil and to search for life, and of course to take photographs. And there you go, you are looking at the very first clear photograph ever taken of the Martian surface. Now that doesn't look like much, but trust me, it was a huge deal back in 1976. And it got even better as Viking 1 returned these panoramic images of the Martian landscape. And you can see it's a very desolate, barren wasteland. Viking 1 also returned some color panoramics. And you can see that right here. And you see these little holes in the ground? These were dug by Viking 1 to examine the soil. And although no microbes were found, the soil did contain a lot of silicone and iron. And subsequent missions would also find a lot more silicone. So that's something that's abundant on the surface of Mars. Now the twin of Viking 1 was Viking 2. And that landed in a different area of the planet. But the photographs looked remarkably similar. As you can see how desolate everything looks. Now the Viking mission were in the mid 70s but in the mid 90s NASA began to launch a whole bunch of new satellites and so let's take a look at those right now now an early satellite was called the global surveyor and that achieved orbital insertion in 1997 its primary mission was to identify landing spots for the rover missions and we'll talk about the rovers in the next slide now global surveyor lasted almost a decade before NASA lost contact in 2006 now the next orbital satellite satellite was the Mars Odyssey, and that achieved orbital insertion in 2001. Its primary mission was to detect water patterns on the surface of Mars. It also looked for volcanic activity. Now the Mars Odyssey is still operational, and so it is the longest serving spacecraft in the history of Mars. The most recent satellite launched is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, 
and that achieved orbital insertion in 2006, and this is the best of the bunch. It can actually monitor daily weather patterns around Mars, and so it can relay a lot more information and data than the previous satellites. It is still operational, and it also will assist in any future manned missions. Now let's take a look at the rovers. Now the rovers had several advantages over the Viking landers, because the Viking landers were stationary, so the rovers could examine more territory, and also could be directed to interesting features, and so they had a lot more capabilities than the Viking landers. Now the first rover was the Sojourner, and that landed on Mars in 1997, and as I said, it was the very first rover, and you can see those solar panels that are on top of it. Now its battery was not rechargeable, so it only lasted about three months, but it paved the way for future rover missions, and the next rover missions were Spirit, and Opportunity, and they were twins, so they were exact duplicates of each other. And they landed on Mars in 2003 and 2004, and they had more capabilities than Sojourner. They also had rechargeable batteries, so that gave them a much longer lifespan. The Opportunity is actually still working today, even after going through a massive dust storm on Mars. Now the latest rover is the Curiosity, and this is the leader of the pack. Curiosity landed on Mars in 2012. It has a space laser and an array of fantastic equipment that it can use. It is also much larger than the other rovers. Now its primary mission is to examine the geology on Mars, as well as examine the climate and roll of water. Now there's that space laser that I was talking about that Curiosity has, so it can blast things on Mars. And that rock in the picture on the right was blasted by Curiosity. Now, Curiosity has returned some great photographs. It took this nice panoramic picture of the Martian sunset. It also took the very first nighttime photo of the surface of Mars. And in this final picture, you can see all of the rovers next to each other. And you can see just how much bigger Curiosity is than the other rover. So as I said, it has quite a few gizmos that it can use. It even has a dust cleaner, so it can even clean the dust off Martian rocks. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the primary attractions on Mars. Now the first major attraction is Olympus Mons. It is the largest volcano in the solar system. It is 14 miles in height, and if you can imagine this, it is three times taller than Mount Everest. So this would be a mountain climber's dream to take on this Titan. The volcano is so large it would cover nearly the entire area of France. Now you might ask, how can a volcano get that large? Well, it is believed Mars does not have plate tectonics, so the continents do not move, and so that allows volcanoes to build endlessly through time. Now the next big attraction would be the Valoris Marineris, and that is one of the largest canyons in the solar system. And you can see just how large that canyon is. It's almost 2,500 miles long, 120 miles wide, and 23,000 feet deep. Now there's been a lot of debate how this was formed. But one of the theories that's been floated around is that it might have been formed by erosion of water or flowing water when Mars had oceans. Now Mars has numerous impact craters, and some of those are the largest craters in the solar system. One such crater is called the Victoria Crater, and the Opportunity rover actually visited this crater on land and took that wonderful panoramic image that you see at the bottom of the slide. And the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter took some fabulous photographs from above. Now the Victoria Crater has some very interesting coves and also some sand dunes in the middle. So this was a fascinating place to have one of the rovers visit. And again, that's a huge advantage over the Viking landers. Now as I said, Mars has two moons. The largest moon is Phobos, and it is 14 miles in diameter and it is very close to Mars. It is only 3,700 miles above Mars. Now to give you an idea, our moon is 250,000 miles away from Earth. Now as you can see, it is irregularly shaped and it has no atmosphere due to low gravity and mass. Now over the eons of time, Phobos has been moving closer to Mars and eventually it'll crash right into Mars and that'll be a massive explosion. And then Mars will only have one moon left and that is Deimos. Now on the right there, you can see that massive impact crater on Phobos. And there's a better shot of that impact crater. And actually you can see more recent impact craters inside the larger impact crater. So Phobos over time has been getting pelted by asteroids. Now of course Deimos is the smaller of the two Martian moons, and it is only eight miles in diameter. 
Now, this moon is probably a captured asteroid, and Deimos is farther away from Mars than Phobos, so there's really no risk of a collision with Mars. Now, a manned mission to Mars has been the subject of numerous proposals throughout the 20th and 21st century. And these proposals not only talk about landing on Mars, there are some that even talk about terraforming the entire planet, as well as exploiting its two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Now, the challenges to a manned mission to Mars involve cost, and that's a really huge issue, because anytime you send humans into space, you have to build life support systems, and so the costs go up quite dramatically. Also, it's safer for robots, because they can do a lot of the work now that humans can do. And so if there's a crash, or if the mission has some major problem, you're not risking human lives, you're just risking a robot. Other issues involve exposure to radiation, and there's a lot of unknowns about that. So how would that affect an astronaut that's exposed to high levels of radiation for a long time? The other issue is that astronauts would be exposed to low gravity for a long, long time. And how would that affect their bodies? And that's been shown to have a negative effect on the human body. Muscles start to break down and several other problems can occur. And one of the final issues is isolation. That is, there's a good chance that the first astronauts that colonize Mars might might be there for a very, very long time. And so what factor would isolation play on their mental psyche? But there are many reasons why we should go to Mars. And the biggest reason is that humans have always been explorers. Can you imagine if Columbus or some of the other explorers during his time period decided not to venture out into the oceans? I think we'd have a very different world today. The other reason is space exploration has always been dangerous. And certainly the space shuttle disasters come closest to mind. Now, another fascinating thing to think about is that Mars could be used as a staging area or a base for future missions into the outer reaches of the solar system and even perhaps beyond the solar system. And the final point I want to make is that this would be a unifying event for the human race in the same way Apollo 11 was. Okay, that is going to do it for this video. The next stop is Jupiter.